Open your Bibles, please, to John chapter 1. This is the fifth sermon I have done in John chapter 1. Um, I've slowed down. As I, I shared with you, I, I've taught John a couple of times, more than a couple of times, and I'm currently just enjoying it. And, I, and I've heard from Paul that we're enjoying it. No need to hurry up. We're just enjoying it. So Theron did tell me that by the time his daughter Hannah graduates, we will have finished the book of John. And I'm not sure if that was a compliment, but thank you, Theron, for realizing we're going slower. This is actually part two of a sermon that I'd already started in John chapter one called Finding Jesus. Finding Jesus. Each of us has a story of how we came to the Lord. Some came through a cult. Some came as an atheist. Some were religious but never saved. Some actually persecuted the church. I know I did. I remember utterly trying to utterly humiliate my Christian friend. I remember it to this very day. I've tried to find him on Facebook and on other places. I cannot find him. I, someday maybe God will let me see him. He does not know I'm saved. And I persecuted him terrible. Some have come to Christ because it makes sense intellectually. They've decided it's the right thing to do. Others have come to Christ simply because a miracle happened and that was the only way they could explain it was that there was God well, John chapter 1 kind of ends, the second part of chapter 1, with an introduction to five different people who follow Jesus, and every one of them comes to Jesus in a different way. We've already covered the first person. Who was the first one to believe that Jesus was the Christ? John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the first one to confess Jesus was the Christ. And how did that happen? Well, he said it in John 1, 31. I did not know him but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit. He actually saw the Holy Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. So as John was baptizing people, he had some inkling, probably, that Jesus was special, because he told him, I should be baptized by you. He baptizes him, and then literally heaven opens up, the Holy Spirit descends, floats down like a dove, sits on Jesus, and then he hears a voice, it says. When Jesus had been baptized in Matthew 3, he came up out of the water, the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him, and suddenly a voice. Hey, this is my beloved Son, I am, in whom I am well pleased. Now that's, that's a great way to come to Jesus. Very few of us have probably had that occur. Right where you were actually reading the Bible, the heavens opened up, the Spirit of God descended upon the Scriptures, which you saw, and then God said, this is my Son. Did anybody have that testimony? Okay, so his was a little unique, by a miracle. But I want to tell you that the majority of churches, and I covered this already, that I have seen started across the world, the vast majority in Asia, at least, are through miracles. Miracles like this. And I thought as I'd go through and I'd share testimonies of people who had these type of salvation testimonies, I want to share the miracle testimony. There was a woman named Grace. She was a Sri Lankan refugee, very poor and illiterate. She couldn't read. But she would pray four, five, six hours a day. That was her ministry. And God did unusual miracles, as it says, that Paul did through her. And they were trying to plant a church, her and her husband, Peter, and their two sons who'd been trained as pastors, and they were trying to plant a church in this village, and nobody was there. So they were in their house one day, and this family came in. You could only understand this if you understand the Indians. This family, this woman came in with a dead baby, and she said, you keep saying your God raises the dead, and literally, she lays the baby down in the midst of this small family group and says, cause, let your God make this baby alive, and if he can't, you bury him. And she walked out. Now, God spoke somehow to Grace in her ear or in her heart, I don't know, and said, if you will pray for 30 minutes, I will raise this child. He didn't tell anybody else in the group. So they began praying, Lord, raise this child so that people will know that you're the God who raises the dead. And they prayed, and they prayed for five, ten minutes. And I've often thought, how long would you pray for a dead baby to rise before you finally said it's not the Lord's will? Well, the brothers, 
the, her two sons, they prayed for a while, and after 10, 15 minutes, they're like, okay, this is over. The baby's not going to raise. The husband quit. I think there was another believer there, quit. But Grace didn't quit. She was watching the clock, because the Lord had told her, if you will pray for 30 minutes, I will raise this baby. So she ended up being the only one praying at the end, and they're all, of course, they're nicely quiet, like some of us in our prayer groups while other people are praying. And she prayed and prayed and prayed, and 30 minutes in, the baby began breathing. Guess what? Everybody in that village is now a Christian. Their testimony was the same as John the Baptist. It came from a miracle. But it's not everybody's testimony, right? The next people in our list after John the Baptist, who were the next people to follow Jesus? The next people to follow Jesus after John the Baptist were Andrew and probably John. He doesn't give the name. He's the one who never talks about himself. So Andrew and John come next. Did they come because they saw a miracle? No. Why did they follow Jesus? Because John and Andrew had come 70 miles, probably on foot, from the far north to come hear this wild man preach. John the Baptist. He was a wild man. He was, seemed to be a man of God. He was baptizing people and preparing people's hearts for the Lord. They came all the way down, so they had made this pilgrimage to hear this prophet. How many of you would walk 70 miles to hear a man preach? So they had made a commitment right? And at this point, they were his disciples, it says. They'd actually come to believe him. He was from God, and they believed him. So one day, John testifies, that is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, or as the Bible says, that is the one who all by himself lifts up the sins of the cosmos. Remember that? And they believed him. They believed the preacher. So they stopped following John and started following Jesus. As Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Sometimes you're just following the preacher. That guy seems sincere. And what he says, it touches my heart. But one day he points to Jesus. And pretty soon you hear Jesus say, why don't you come and see? Come and see. I know a man, an older man, who was recently just lamenting of how things have changed in our culture. He said, Travis, I used to go into a store, and if I couldn't find an item, I would say, Could, do you know where such and such is? He said, you know what people used to do? They used to say, yes, yes, follow me, I'll show you. He says, now they just point, aisle 36, halfway down. But it used to be they would take the time to actually lead you to where you needed to go. Christianity isn't about you telling people where to go. Christianity is about Jesus leading people where to go. So they can believe the preacher, but only far enough to follow Jesus. If you follow the preacher your whole life, you will go to hell. At some point, you have to stop following the preacher and start following the Savior. And so Jesus said, come and see. Now, this is the testimony of those who've grown up in church, and that's probably most of you. I actually have had somebody apologize to me for their testimony. That's kind of boring, they'll say. It's kind of boring. I grew up in the church. I think I knew him when I was two, and I got baptized when I was seven, and I've, I've always known him. I'm sorry it's not more exciting. A lot of us would like Mark Townsend's testimony, right? Previous drug dealer, almost gets cut in half by a big old sword, right? Or maybe they want Ann Butler's testimony, also involved in drugs, consumed with their own life, came to Jesus. You know, maybe they want Steve Murphy's testimony. Maybe you know some of the people who have these radical, wow, really bad people to transformed people. But most of us don't have that testimony. Most of us just have Andrew and John's testimony. We believed, met Jesus, and started following. That's not somehow less. Do you know why? Because these are the two who became 12 of, two of the 12 of the apostles. So they were truly blessed by God with their testimony. They believed. Jesus said, come and see, and they began following. Now we move on to Peter, and that's where we're at today. Peter. Let's read. We're starting in verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, 
in which is, which is translated the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Now, for the rest of Peter's life, he'll remember that his little brother is the one who brought him to Jesus. John the Baptist found Jesus through a miracle. Andrew and John found Jesus through a preacher. Peter found Jesus through his brother's witness, his younger brother's witness. Now, I've seen this again and again. I don't know if you have, but when a person truly finds Jesus, they immediately have what Jesus refers to as their first love, that overflowing. It's like a reference to when two people fall in love and they're married and they hold each other's hands and they talk about each other and they, they're continuing. I'm watching it right now. There's Jordan and Clemmie right now holding the hands in public, right? It's the first, oh, there's hand holding over Derek and Gracious, hand holding going on. Dave and Kelly are not holding hands. Oh, anyways, it's the first love. It's the difference between being married a long time and being married just recently. There's this first love. It's also when you come to Christ. Suddenly, you are willing and comfortable walking through awkward conversations because you simply don't care. You love Jesus so much, you want people to know about him. And I think back on this one time, Tim, I see Tim Payne's out there. He said, the first time he'd seen me when I came back to Camas Valley in 1997, I was in Market Plus and he was in Market Plus. And he said the thing that shocked him is I came into the Market Plus and was just openly, comfortably, actively, excitedly talking about Jesus in public. Now, he is a Christian, and he said he struggled with that. It's like, that is just really, really public, what he's doing right there. But God had just called me into the ministry. I was so full of excitement. I just wanted to talk about Jesus to everybody, and it was shocking, and I was completely unaware of it. It's, it's, it's the first love when God's calling you. So oftentimes, the person you want to witness to the most, the one your heart beats for, is your family. You want to share with your family. Andrew wasn't happy just following Jesus by himself. He had to find Peter. Now, that means Peter had also come down to John the Baptist, by the way. He's in the area. And he calls him and wants him to meet Jesus. By the way, that is what is behind in 1 Corinthians 7 when it says an unbelieving husband is sanctified by his wife and an unbelieving wife is sanctified by her husband. That's what it means. It means they get a daily, everyday witness of the love of their spouse for Jesus. And that sets apart them from those who do not have a believer. Now, I have seen this again and again where one family member comes to Christ and then what happens? Have you seen it? All of them do. How does that happen? Because the one who comes to Christ is like Andrew. He begins bringing everybody else. I have a cousin named Todd. This is his testimony. Todd is in prison right now. Do you know why Todd is in prison? Because Todd turned himself in for a crime that nobody knew happened. Here's what happened. Todd met Jesus. When Todd met Jesus, he began feeling guilt and shame and pain for a sin, for a crime that he had committed that nobody knew about. So he turns himself in. He walks to the police station, turns himself in for a crime nobody knew about. And he pleads guilty and goes to prison. He's in prison right now. It so troubled his family. Why would anybody do such a thing that his dad got saved? Because it had to be Jesus, and his mom got saved, and his sister got saved, and his brother-in-law got saved, and his grandma got saved, and she was well on in years. Todd may spend years and maybe even decades in prison, but he will spend eternity with his family because he, like Andrew, shared the gospel. I want to tell you, share the gospel with your family Share the gospel. You are the one who God set apart to sanctify your family. You. Be an Andrew. Take him to Jesus. Now the rest of verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, now this is an important word. You can circle the word looked. Optonomai, that's the Greek word for letting light go in your eye. So if I just let light go in my eye, and I'm looking at you, Paul, and it's kind of going in, but nothing's happening in my brain, that's autonomy. There's electrical signals saying, hey, there's an image. This is not that word. 
This word is emblepo. It's the word Jesus uses when he says, look at the birds of the air, how your father takes care of them. He didn't mean just look at the birds of the air. Oh, look at the birds, the birds, the birds. Here's a bird right there, right? No, he meant pay attention to how God cares for them. Look at the birds. It often is behold. It also means to discern. So when Jesus looked at Peter, he didn't just say, here comes somebody. He literally looked into Peter. You could put that in there. He looked into Peter. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked into Peter, into him, he said, first words that Jesus ever said to Simon, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. Now that was shocking. He'd never met the man. Now he knows his name. He knows his dad's name. He knows the story. You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated stone or rock. Now, I want you to think about that. Can you imagine that the first time, okay, so Dave, I got it right. First time I meet Dave, right, he comes up, we shake hands. Hey, Dave, you're no longer going to be called Dave. We're calling you Bob. Shocking, right? Can you imagine? No, not only that, I know your dad, but I would know your dad anyway, so that doesn't matter. But if you're a total stranger, I know you, I know your dad, and your name's no good anymore. We're changing your name from here on out. That's a little jarring. Well, it's nice to meet you too, right? How would you feel if someone did that to you? Here's an interesting thing that came out as I studied John. We're never told why he did it. We are never told why he changed Peter's name. So to, you know, Simon to Peter. We only, we're only told what it means. It means rock or, or, or stone in this instance. In the other gospels, you look around, you're like, somebody had to have recorded why he changed his name. He changed his name the very first day he met him, the very first moment, the very first words. Now, why? Don't know. We're just told in the other gospels that he's Simon, whom Jesus called Peter. At one point, after three years of ministry, Three years of following Jesus, they're at Caesarea Philippi. In just a matter of months, Jesus is going to be crucified. Three years after Jesus has changed his name, he says this, Hey, you're Peter, because I named you Peter. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He tells Peter, Peter at that point in time had just said, You're the Christ, publicly. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter and and Jesus says, yep, you're Peter, and I'm going to build my church on a rock. So at that point in time, we get a little idea that Peter's attitude, he was a leader. He was kind of a tough guy. He was also mouthy. But he was also bold. On the rock, I will build my church. So later on, we get kind of a hint, but we are never actually told why Jesus changed his name. Just he did. He looked into him. So why would Jesus change his name? Let's just think about that. Well, we don't know, but one thing is certain. Jesus didn't see like other people saw. We look at each other and we see people this way. But what did, what did Jesus, what did God say to Samuel? Samuel, the prophet, I mean, a guy who walks with God, he's looking for a king. He finds um, David's older brother, right? Jesse's oldest son. And he goes, oh, that's the king. That's the king. And what does God say to him? Don't look at the outward appearance. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He ended up picking the youngest kid who's kind of red-faced, came in from the field, smells like a sheep. That was the king of Israel because God knew his heart. One thing we can know, God knew Peter's heart. He knew this guy is going to go all the way. He'll never turn back. When things get tough, he'll be there with me to the end. Peter didn't know that. Jesus knew that. Jesus looked at him and said, I know who you are. You're Peter. Now, I want to encourage you. You may think that you know yourself, but you know what? You don't. I look back on my life, and I had no idea I would be where I am today. I had no idea that I would be living in Camas Valley, the place I despised growing up. I had no idea that I would be making phone calls internationally, rescuing people from dying because so many people had joined with me in the work of God 
that we are now saving lives. I had no idea. God looked at me. He knew all these things. He could have said, Travis, I don't like your name. From now on, you're going to be missionary. Right? He could have done that, and I would have looked at him and said, are you kidding me? I haven't even read the whole Bible yet. God sees you the way you're going to be. Don't get stuck in the way you are. God sees the way you're going to be. Jesus sees into you. Now, Peter's shocked, right? The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. So now if Simon has now become Peter, now we're moving on to Philip. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. So he's headed up north, going to go back to his hometown. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. He found Philip. Isn't that interesting? The others had discovered Jesus, but Philip didn't discover Jesus. Philip is just doing his thing, blah, 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 over here. Jesus goes and finds him. That is the testimony of more than one person. I'm going to tell you a story of a man named Salim. He was in Iraq during the war between the Muslims, actually, the Sunnis and the Shiites in Iraq, and he got put in prison. I don't know what he did, but while in prison, Jesus appeared to him. Now, I know this from firsthand testimony. Jesus appeared to this Muslim and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. By the way, of all the people I know who have this testimony, and I know a lot who have seen Jesus, who have shared the gospel, he almost always shares John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus says to the people. So mark that down. That's worth memorizing if Jesus is quoting it all the time. He appears to him, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You need to follow me. I'm going to send you a Bible. And he disappears. So here's Salim. That's not his name, by the way. It was like Ahmed or Abdul or Muhammad before he changed his name to Salim, which means peace. But he's in prison by himself. I'm going to get a Bible. First of all, it's a Muslim country. How am I going to get a Bible? But God said, Jesus appeared to me. I'm going to get a Bible. He said, the very next day, another man was taken captive who was also fighting. He was a Christian and he had a little Bible. He shows up in the cell next to Salim and he says, Jesus told me to give you my Bible. So he gives him a Bible through the bars. Salim has a Bible, reads the Bible, gets out of prison, goes back to this unnamed country. It's a very closed country. And before he is martyred, he was eventually beat to death in his bed next to his wife by the Muslims. Before he's beaten to death, which is years and years later, like 30 years later, he had led, his country had zero Christians that were known. When I met him, there were more than 1,200 that he had led to the Lord in his country, 1,200 believers. He didn't find Jesus. Jesus found him. He was in prison, right? I could tell you more than one story. I can tell you the story about the chief um, priest in Ramaswaram, southern India. He trained all the other priests and was a part of hiring people to kill the Christians. I can tell you how one day Jesus appeared to him at the foot of his bed. He woke up and there was Jesus Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You need to follow me. And how are you going to find me? You need to go talk to Moses Paulos, actually his wife. You need to go talk to Sarah Jem Paulos. This is somebody they'd hunted. He tried to kill these people. So Billy, their son, tells me the story. He shows up at the front door. He pounds on the gate. <laughs> Billy, he's a little boy. He goes over there, opens the gate, sees this guy, freaks out, slams the door, kind of like they did with Peter when he got escaped from jail. Um, slams the door, runs back inside, and says, they're after us. So later on, the, someone a little older goes out there, he keeps beating, opens the door, and he's like, I need to talk to Sarah Jim. He said, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I need to talk to you, and you'll tell me how to be saved. He didn't find Jesus. Jesus found him. So many testimonies like this. Now, I love this. Let's look at the next verse. So now, Philip is saved because Jesus found him, not because of the preacher, not because of the miracles, not because of a witness, not because of any of those, because Jesus just said, I'm going to find you, plucks him out. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, so they're all kind of related. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him. Wait a second. 
you didn't find him. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now that's exciting, but is it true? We have found him? Well, maybe Andrew and John could say we found him. Maybe actually John the Baptist could say we found him. Maybe Peter could say we found him. Philip, he couldn't say we found him. He was found, right? Now, I want to talk to you about a debate that is not worth having. Calvinism and Arminianism. What does that mean, Travis? I hope you don't even know. Calvinism says that you are um, chosen by God. I'll just sim- summarize that. God comes to you. God gives you faith. God gives you the ability to believe. God is so sovereign, so sovereign over you that you have no decisions. You can only be born again by Jesus, and then you decide after you're born again, the Spirit of God tells you you're now saved, and now you believe in Jesus. That's Calvinism in a nutshell. Armenianism is you have all the decisions. It's the exact opposite. It's the other side of the scale. You make all the decisions. God just kind of stands back and begs you to come to him, but you never, you know, you get to choose. Everybody makes their own decision. There's really the sovereignty of God is much, much less. Who's right? Did Philip find Jesus or did Jesus find Philip? What's the answer? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Why? Jesus said this, you did not choose me, but I have chosen you that you would go and bear fruit. He said that to his 12 disciples. But Andrew and John could say, wait a second, we chose you. Philip could say, well, I think maybe he chose me because I didn't find him, he found me. But some of those apostles, Jesus walked by and said, follow me to Matthew. Guess what Matthew had to decide? Jesus did not go in the tax collector booth, pry Matthew's hands off of the wealth, drag him out of the tax collector booth, pull him down the road for three years. Everybody had to make their own decision. Everybody had to decide when Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. Everybody had to decide. So here's the fact. Jesus found you, and you found Jesus, and that's all that matters at this point. So don't get engaged in the debate that people want to argue about who found who. You could say this, well, Jesus found Philip, but Philip thought he found Jesus. It all depends on your viewpoint, because you guys, Jesus did call other people. You know that. He called the rich young ruler of Mark chapter 10. It says, Jesus looked at him, Jesus loved him, said to him, you only lack one thing. Go sell what you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. Same thing he said to the apostles. They forsook all, it says, and followed Jesus. The rich young ruler did not forsake all and did not follow Jesus. Instead, it says he went away sorrowful. Jesus did the same thing to both of them. Jesus is calling. You know, the, Jesus said, no one could come to me unless the Spirit of God draws him. You know, Jesus is drawing you right now. If you are not saved, Jesus is drawing you right now, and he's using my voice to do it and the feeling in your heart that you have. If you're watching on the internet and you're getting this quickening, your heart is beating faster, that's Jesus calling. And guess what? You will decide whether you will be found He's found you, but you're going to decide whether you stay found. It's your decision. You can't blame God when you get to heaven or not heaven. So Philip found Nathanael and said, We found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I like Nathanael. He's a skeptic. And Nathanael said, "Uh, uh, 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 I'm not falling for that. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, those of you who've traveled to the Middle East or traveled to Israel and have been to Nazareth, it's the same thing today. Nazareth is dumpy. It's a dumpy little place that you just hold onto your wallet and try not to breathe deeply, right? It's not a nice place. And it wasn't during the time of Jesus. And so Nathaniel's like, yeah, Nazareth. Wait a second, let's read the scriptures. Where in the Bible does it say the Messiah comes out of Nazareth? It did, by the way, but he didn't know it. 
he shall be a Nazarene. But, and Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, just come and see. That's such a great introduction. I hope you're inviting people this summer to church. You have a great excuse. It's weird. We're sitting next to Highway 42 listening to bikers go by, right? The kids swinging and making dust. We're, you know, we're all sitting in chairs outside. This is unusual. I guarantee we're being noticed. It's unusual enough that you can invite people. Just come and see. I don't know if I believe that Jesus stuff. Just come and see, right? Now, Nathaniel's heart is right. He's just a critical thinker. I was a critical thinker. Maybe you were a critical thinker. I didn't believe, really, pretty much once I hit 15, I didn't believe anybody except myself, right? It wasn't until I got older I realized how little I knew. So Nathaniel, he's not a man who's easily swayed by somebody else's opinion. So Philip says, forget my opinion. Come meet him. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him, I love this, and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. There's a man of integrity. Whoa, wait, wait a second, wait a minute. How do you know me? A man of integrity. So Jesus, just, he just kind of like, oh, you don't believe Nathaniel? Let me just tell you. Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? How do you know I'm a man of integrity? Jesus answers, you know, it's really only Jesus can answer like this. Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Whoa, wait a second. How'd you see me? I was under a fig tree a long ways away. How did you see me? I was just under the fig tree for 30 minutes. How did you see me? You're here, right? Suddenly, Nathaniel's skepticism is getting a little messed up because of prophecy. Nathaniel is stunned. <laughs> then, he, in fact, he goes too far. Not too far. You can't go too far with Jesus. But he doesn't just say, you're the Christ. He says, you're the rabbi. You're the teacher. You're the son of God. You're the king of the universe. You're the everything. You're the Alpha, the Omega. You're the... Just from this little prophecy, right? A little, I saw you under a fig tree. Nathaniel is totally messed up. This is my testimony. This is how I came to Jesus. Prophecy. Prophecy. It starts with this premise. So I'm a scientist. I'm looking at the Bible. I don't like the way church makes me feel. I don't know about when you got saved, but I didn't enjoy going to church when I wasn't saved. I felt bad. I went home feeling bad. And pretty soon I'm like, I'm done with this church stuff because it doesn't make me feel good. I feel sick and scared and guilty and I'm done. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at the Bible and I'm going to prove whether or not I can prove the Bible is true. So I just began taking it apart. I started with this premise. Prophecy is impossible. Who disagrees with that? That prophecy is impossible. Well, I don't mean with God. I mean, if you're a straight-up evolutionist who believes in only matter and no spiritual things, is prophecy possible? No. You can do a statistical calculation, but who in the world would ever prophesy that the first king of Greece would rule the world when Greece wasn't even a kingdom. Not the second king of Greece, not a king of Greece, the first king of Greece. Alexander the Great, hundreds of years before he was born. Who thinks that we can name who will be the leader of Australia in 200 years by name? That's what God does with Cyrus, the Persian. Now, here's the thing. Either that's a lie, and it was written after the fact, or there's a God. That's where I started. There's got to be a God. If it's true, there's got to be a God. In fact, it's the test. Prophecy is the test God gives to all the other false gods. Here's his test in Isaiah 41. You should have this. You should give it to your Mormons and your Jehovah's Witnesses and your Hindus and your Buddhists and your Muslims and your everybody but Christian. Ask this. Show me the prophecy of your scriptures. Show me how they came true. Because God lays out a test in Isaiah 41 that says this to all the gods. Present your case. Bring forth and show us what will happen. Declare to us things to come the things that are to come hereafter that we may know that you are God's. That's the test. So when you're arguing doctrine with your, with your Mormon, ask them, 
Show me the prophecies. Show me how they were fulfilled. They don't have any. Actually, they have a ton of prophecies, by the way. They've all fallen short. They're all lies. Joseph Smith's going to live a long life, and his wife's going to die early, and within a year, he's dead, and she lives to be like 96. You know, there's going to be Zion in Missouri. Well, guess what? There's no Zion in Missouri. It's in Utah. Missed it by a few states. I mean, there's a lot of prophecies, but none of them came true. The Bible, however, 25% is prophecy. So all I have to do is I have to prove whether or not it was written before it happened. Well, that's pretty simple to do. Just test it to see if you can prove when it was written. So here's my frustration with those critics out there. And I hope there's some critics watching on TV. Here's my frustration. Are you really a critic or are you just simply a fool? Because there's a lot of fools who call themselves critics. But they're really just fools. You see, a critic can ask the question, can I prove it? That's what a critic does. Can I prove it? The events of the New Testament are so true, just the historical events of the New Testament, that even the unsaved historians, Theron gave me this quote from, from Bart Ehrman, who is a historian, a non-Christian historian, talking to other historians who are atheists, saying, oh, I don't think Jesus ever existed. He said these words, this is an unsaved man, this is not even an issue for scholars of antiquity. In other words, if you're a historian, how could you not believe in Jesus as a man? The reason for thinking Jesus existed is because he is abundantly attested in early sources. If you want to go where the evidence goes, I think that atheists have done themselves a disservice by jumping on the bandwagon of mythicism. In other words, they just say, oh, it's not real. Because frankly, it makes you look foolish to the outside world. If that's what you're going to believe, you're a fool. That's an unsaved man. The testimony of Jesus is so historical. Not only that, what he did is historical. What the Messiah was supposed to do was written down centuries, 600, 700 years before Jesus arrived. He was going to heal the sick. Where the Messiah would be born 400 years before Jesus arrived? Bethlehem. How the Messiah would teach 1,000 years before the Messiah would arrive? He would teach in parables. What his enemies would do to him a thousand years before Jesus shows up, they're going to betray him and crucify him. They're going to pierce his hands and his feet. People don't die like that and tell about the time of Jesus. A true critic has to ask the question, are these true? And if they're true, that means there must be a God. And if there's a God, he must be the one who wrote these things. That is how I got saved. I was a Nathaniel. God simply showed me prophecy. If you do not believe the Old Testament was written before Jesus, you obviously have never read a history book. Have you ever heard of the Septuagint? That was the Greek rendition several hundred years before Jesus was born where they took the entire Old Testament and wrote it in Greek, meaning it was existing before Jesus. Not only that, you can go look at the Masoretic texts or the, the Essene scrolls, the Dead Sea scroll, that was hundreds of years before Jesus it was completed, these texts. So we know it was written before Jesus arrived. And then Jesus did it all. You know what that's called? Prophecy. It's called prophecy. So critic, are you just a fool? Are you really going to take my challenge and find out whether these things are true? Because, you know, this not much hangs in the balance. Only your eternal soul. You'll either be in eternal heaven with joy or eternal hell with torment. You're deciding it based upon whether you'll even ask the question, is it real? You see why those who call themselves critics are most often fools. They haven't even made that effort. Make the effort. Make the effort. But this is nothing. Jesus said, oh, I saw you under a fig tree. Whoop-de-doo. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, 
You are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. You're the, you're the everything. I'm worshiping you. And Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nathaniel's going to see greater things than these. Nathaniel's going to see, I don't know, the raising of the dead. He'll see that, yeah. He's going to see Jesus walking on top of water. Which is bigger, to say I saw you under the fig tree or, you know, taking a stroll across the Sea of Galilee. Nathaniel's going to watch him heal lepers just by touching him. Nathaniel's going to see him break some bread and feed thousands of people from a couple loaves. Nathaniel's going to watch him cast out demons left and right. Nathaniel's going to see him actually restore a man's arm that's all withered up and he's got this little stub of an arm and he's going to see him become a whole arm. The fig tree, Nathaniel, really, the fig tree, that's... You're going to see greater things than the fig tree. Same with me. After I came to believe the Bible, after I saw all the prophecies, after I tested whether they were true or not true, I too have seen things that if I'd seen them before, it would have changed my mind. I have witnessed miracles. I have sat there with a man on my left who was blind and instantly received his sight. I have prayed and seen Mark Townsend, who was very sick from blood disease instantly healed to the point that the, the doctors are still confused how it happened. I have watched a demon-possessed person begin freaking out when I, in English, and she doesn't even read or speak English, when I, in English, said, in Jesus' name, and prayed over her, and watched her freak out and roll around, vomit, and scream. I've watched her, by the way, she was delivered. I have watched these things. Not only that, I have heard God audibly speak like a human voice in my ear, and that's why I'm a preacher. I have been given prophecies and received prophecies, all which I've seen come true. Some of them very scary. Some of them have led to salvation of people who were very scary because God gave me a prophecy about them. But I believe because I tested the Bible and saw whether the prophecies were true. It's called a living faith. You come to Jesus and things are greater than you ever thought. Amen? They're greater than you ever experienced. And if they're not, then you need to come to Jesus. Because when you're with Jesus, greater things than you could ever imagine occur to you. Now, Jesus responds, and this is the last verse in chapter 1, which means this will be the last sermon in chapter 1. And Jesus said to him, he said to him, Most assuredly, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. What? Nathaniel says, I believe because you saw me under a fig tree. Jesus says, that's nothing. Soon you will see heaven open, and the angels ascending and descending upon me. Now, that's a strange reference. Why would you say such a strange thing? By the way, we never see that in the New Testament. There's never a moment in time when the heavens open and the angels ascend and descend on Jesus. We never see it. What's he referring to? Well, every Jew knows exactly what he's referring to. you. So this, this statement, why did he say this? Is because, I believe because it was very powerful and probably very personal. There was only one time in the history of the Bible where the heavens opened and anybody watched the angels ascending and descending. Do you know where it's at? You probably do if you're a Bible reader. It's when Jacob was running away from Esau, trying to save his life, on his way to Uncle Laban's, it says he found a place to sleep in Genesis 28. He found a certain place and lay down and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. The bridge between heaven and earth he found it. Why did Jesus say that? Well, we can see one of the reasons is who's the bridge between heaven and earth, folks? Jesus is the bridge between heaven and earth. But I want to just think about this. It could have been very personal. Do you know why? Where was Nathaniel? Where was he? Under a fig tree. Where did Nathaniel live? You're not following. He lived up in Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee, Bethsaida, right? 
He's a long ways away. So why would Nathaniel be down in the desert? Why is Nathaniel in the desert? John the Baptist, he was on a pilgrimage to hear this prophet 70 miles away. He probably walked down with a bunch of the Galileans to meet him, right? So Nathaniel is on a spiritual journey. He's sitting under a fig tree. What do you think Nathaniel's probably doing? Probably meditating, praying. Do you know that the Talmud encouraged men to go find literally a large tree and read the scriptures daily underneath it and meditate? Now, this is all just conjecture. It's not in the Bible. But here's a guy on a pilgrimage sitting under a tree by himself. Have any of you ever gone on a pilgrimage or on a mission trip and you've gone under a tree and sat down by yourself? I have many times. You know what you're doing? You're usually talking to the Lord reading the Bible, having a quiet time, as Terry would call it, quiet time. Would it have been unreasonable to think that maybe he was reading Genesis 28? He's just sitting underneath this tree reading Genesis 28, and Philip comes and, hey, we found the Messiah, and he's like, Messiah from Nazareth, yeah, right. He comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, you're going to watch heaven open, and the angels are going to ascend and descend on me. It could be that. I know that's happened to me. Has it happened to you? When you, in the morning, you have a quiet time, you're reading, you get up, you start going through your day, and then suddenly, partway through your day, what you read was exactly what you needed to know that day. God has done that to me many times. Maybe he's doing that to Nathaniel. But whether this was a personal message or not, that's just going to be up there in conjecture. We're just going to have to think about it. Here's what we do know. It was a powerful message. Because every single Jew knew exactly what Jacob said when he woke up. Do you know what he said when he woke up? Surely God is in this place, and I did not know it. Jesus looks at Nathaniel and says, you're going to see heaven open up. You're going to see angels ascending and descending on me. Because surely God is in this place, and you... Nathaniel, you don't know it. He was saying to him, you have no idea who I am. So John chapter 1 shows us five different ways to get saved. I don't care which one you choose, but you must choose one of them. You can believe the prophecy. You can believe the preacher. You can be led to the Lord by your, your brother or sister. You can have a miracle. Jesus can supernaturally just appear before you. I don't care how you get saved, but you must be saved. There is no other name given under heaven among men by whom we must be saved. If you do not believe in Jesus, you are not saved. And I don't know if you're looking out there, it's worse. The United States and the world is at the worst I've ever witnessed. I've never seen anything like this. There is rioting and unrest and starvation and anger and hatred and violence and homosexuality exploding and abortions and sexual sin everywhere. We are living the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, or I would say in the days of Noah. Do you not say we are living in those days? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and giving a marriage until... Noah entered the ark, and the flood came. You must be saved from this time. You must be saved. Come through a miracle, come through a preacher, come through a witness, come through a prophecy, it doesn't really matter. You must come. I'm going to close with a reading of Romans chapter 10, 8 through 13. I'm just going to read it. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Again, if you are believing, it is important that you tell somebody. Even in our friends in that country that I'm not naming, even though they hide and do not share their faith openly, they have been leading people to Jesus. You know how? By sharing their faith privately. They've even shared their faith with us today publicly because we're safe. They have found a way to let others know, I believe in Jesus. I am following Jesus. You need to do the same. That's what confessing with your mouth means. But you must also believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And the resurrection is the key point. You've got to believe Jesus is alive to be saved. Now, I'm going to ask you in two weeks to come to creation camp and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I have been talking about it for a month now. That you would come and publicly take a stand that you were going to follow Jesus and you would let your spouse know and your children know and your parents know and you would take that stand for the Lord. I want to encourage you to do that. We're going to have some sort of a baptismal set up at creation camp. Come be baptized before all and confess the Lord Jesus as your Savior and be saved. Lord, I ask you to bless this word into our hearts. I want to thank you for the different testimonies you have shown us, Lord. I'm going to thank you for how you saved me. I want to thank you for how you found some of us, Lord, and how others of us discovered you. I want to thank you for the miracles. I want to thank you for so many people that have met you personally, Lord, in dreams and in visions. I love you. I want to say publicly that I believe in Jesus. I'm trusting in him despite whatever happens in this world. I'm believing every word he said and wrote, and I'm going to follow him even if it means my death. I just want to say that out loud. I want to pray, Lord, that each of us could say that out loud, that we would be people of faith. Bless and keep us on this day, the day you made. Amen.